Hey everybody, this is Tommy Tellerico, CEO of Intellivision, and I'm very proud to announce our Moon Patrol High Score Contest. Now this video is gonna be in two parts. First part is I'm gonna explain what the contest is and how you can submit your high score to win the prize. And the second half of it is going to be me discussing my collection of retro video games. So if you wanna know about the contest, I put that first and then you can get out of there after that. But if you're interested in some really interesting stories about some of this hardware and how I acquired it and the history behind all this old school stuff, I thought this might be a cool video because we're talking about Moon Patrol. That'd be a cool video to give you a little tour. But uh, anyway, first onto the Moon Patrol contest. Now, how do you play Moon Patrol? Well, you have to get our Amico Club app. It's available on iOS, Apple, iPhone, uh, and Android. So you just go in, search Amico Club, you download that app, and you'll get a whole free first level of our Moon Patrol game that's going to be available on launch when the Intellivision Amico launches on April 15th, 2021, or for our founders, it'll be launching 4321 launch. So you download the app and you play the game. And whatever your high score is at the end of the level, take a screenshot of that and you're gonna email that to us. The email address is moonpatrol at intellivisionentertainment.com. Again, moonpatrol at intellivisionentertainment.com. Email your screenshot. And what we're gonna do is every few days, we'll post the lead score so far on all of our social media channels like you know <clears throat> facebook twitter things like that so 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 that you'll know the score that you're going to need to be right so send us that screenshot the contest lasts till the end of the month so the cutoff is going to be midnight on halloween october 31st you have from now until midnight Halloween to email us your Moon Patrol scores and who's going to be the high winner. Now, who, what's the winner going to win? Well, check this out. This is what they're going to win. This is the marquee. This is the original marquee from the Moon Patrol arcade game. And uh, look, look at this. It even has, this is what the side of the cabinet looked like at the, at the top. So really super uh, high quality and it has an LED and you can actually change, you can actually change the colors of the light. Whoa, I almost, I almost broke it. There would have been no contest. It would have been over. No, the, uh, the uh, uh, you can even change the lights and stuff, but not only uh, will I be signing this and this is one out of one. There's only one of these in the world that'll be signed by myself and the original producer of the original Moon Patrol game, Scott Samura. And Scott was also the former president of Nintendo of America for their internal development team. So if you ever played games like Wave Race 64, that was, that was Scott back in the day. So anyway, this is the prize. So there you have it. Good luck on the Moon Patrol contest and may the best score win. Now I'd like to show you a little bit of my personal video game hardware collection and some of the interesting things I have and the history behind them all. I typically try to collect things that are either brand new in the box, never been opened, or something that people have taken care of sometimes for 40 to 50 years. So uh, like, here's a good example. This is an old uh, kind of, this is a machine from the seventies. Now, typically, you know, uh, machines like this that are white, usually tarnish and get really yellow over the ages. Uh, but you can see this one is, is actually brand new, uh, 45 years old. I thought this was interesting though, to show you, look at the controllers back then, you know, it was a slider because these were all, they were kind of like Pong ripoffs. There were literally hundreds of different video game consoles in the 70s. They're considered generation one. And they were all basically Pong ripoffs. Atari, Intellivision, 
Those are really considered generation two, ColecoVision and some of the rest, but um, some people lop those in with generation one, but those are really gen two. So, so this is it. So this is interesting though, because I, I, I make a note of this because the slider with Amico's touchscreen, you know, it can act just like this did back then. You can use your finger to slide it, you know, like, like that. So anyway, very interesting. I mean, you know, look at some of this stuff is really cool. Again, look at this is, this has never even been taken off until just now. I just screwed it up. No, it's, it's, these are brand new machines. They look super brand new, but again, these are 40 to 45 years old. This is a really rare machine. Check this out. This is a Pong type machine. Now for this, they put the dials right on here, but this was made in Russia in the 70s and a lot of these got destroyed uh russia was in the, in the 70s was was still it was communist the ussr uh back in the day and a lot of these were actually uh destroyed so these are very very rare to get i can't even pronounce what that says so i'm not even going to try so i don't officially know what the name but i just love the color the, the black uh, the yellow with the with the black accents and a little red button here. Here's a uh, here's a fun machine from Japan. That's it's a race car. This is called the Micro Genius Super King Two, and the two was the race car edition. And uh, you can see how how fun this was. Uh, and you could put cartridges in the top there, and uh, the controllers are here. It was basically like a, a uh, you know, like an NES uh, ripoff. I love the antenna though. And again, shaped like a car and the lights go on here. Ooh, kind of like Amico. So you can see where, you know, a lot of uh, the ideas and the design of Amico actually harken back to a lot of this stuff that, you know, I had before. I'm going to come around here. All right, to show you a few others, look at this one. This is called the Omni Entertainment System. And this was originally done by Milton Bradley. Now, Milton Bradley, I have a personal connection to Milton Bradley because the home office of Milton Bradley was in the hometown that I grew up, Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and, and this was an eight track. If, if anyone like probably over 40, um, remembers this is how we used to play music in our parents' cars or, or whatever they were called, eight tracks. This is before cassette. And so, but the cool thing about eight tracks was that you could change, they had four channels on it and you could change the channel and rewind and reverse. So people made games out of them. In fact, there's a robot that I had growing up. It's actually upstairs. It's called 2XL, which was an interactive robot using eight track. But this was a four player, you know, eight track system, video game system, very unique, very different and very cool. Now, let's look at this thing for a second. Huh, something about this looks a little familiar. Now they made a bunch of these. I think there's, I, I believe there's over 30 variations of this system, Arcadia, um, it was, uh, called a Hamonex was another name for this. And this was licensed all over the world. So depending on what country you were in, you had a, a different version of this. But what's familiar about this? I don't know, there's something, you know, basically they completely ripped off the original in television, even with the disc. They put a little joystick on the disc, which is kind of cool, it's a good idea. Uh, and the games were pretty good. Out of the 30 plus variations, I think I have about nine or 10 of them. Uh, and these are hard to get and they're, they're, they're kind of expensive as well. Look at these old school joysticks they used to do. I mean, these are hardcore and this still works. It's still, there's a great red one uh, as well too that I've been looking for. So uh, if you see it on eBay, don't bid on it. Um, and, uh, cause you will lose. Uh, so, but anyway, this is like arcade quality uh, stuff. Um, oh, now for all the, well, like, let me do this first. This is from Japan. This is a handheld game. You'll notice it's called Puckman. Why is it called Puckman? Because that was the original name of Pac-Man. It was called Puckman. Now you understand, right? A puck 
because he's round and he, you know, his mouth opens. It's a puck man. Why didn't they call it puck man in America or in around the world in English? You could probably guess why, because they were afraid that kids in the arcade back then in, in the early 80s would have taken the P and just, you know, taken a Sharpie or whatever and, and easily changed that to an F. Um, in fact, that probably would have been me, but I'm not going to lie. But, but, but anyway, so it was originally called Puckman, and this was the, the handheld version uh, put out in Japan. So it's really cool. You can get these U.S. versions, and it's called Pac-Man, but this is a Puckman, which is uh, really interesting. And now you know the history behind the name Pac-Man. Now, uh, oh yeah, here's here's a good one. This is this is a Pac-Man phone back then in the old it. Hello? Yes? Yep. Yeah. Yes, Pac-Man? No, I don't know where Miss Pac-Man is. She was out all last night. She never came home. Oh, um, okay. So anyway, that's, that's my Pac-Man phone from the seventies or no, sorry. That's from the, from the eighties for all you Atari fans. Um, you're going to love this. This is an original Atari 2600. That's never been played. I opened the box of this. Now people say like, you know, when you buy unopened things, you know, like toys and action figures, you're supposed to never open them. Like that's, that's like the biggest no, no in the world. Cause it kills the value. I don't care. Um, I, I like to, I like to look at brand new. I like to, the, the feeling of what it was like when you're a kid opening it for the first time and remembering it. Look at this, not a single scratch on it. Preserve for, whoa, no, just kidding. Um, the, um, it's absolutely beautiful and uh, yeah, a big, big fan of this. And I kept the box all good. So when I'm done, I put it back in the box so it doesn't collect dust. But I wanted to show everybody that a, an unplayed, brand new, never opened until now, Atari 2600. And I also have this. When your Atari joysticks went out back in the day, in the late 70s, you could, you know, contact Atari and you could purchase another joystick. They also sold them at retail as well. If you folks remember, uh, like places like Kmart and, uh, um, you know, Sears, you know, had this stuff. But this is, and it was replacement part number CX40. That's the replacement. So here it is. Also a never used uh, Atari joystick. Still stiff as ever. And... Uh, I'll leave it at that. Now, did you know what the very first wireless controller was? You say, hmm, was it the PlayStation 1? Maybe it was, uh, was it something on the, the N64 or something? No, how about the Atari actually had a wireless, this is a, a, a radio frequency, uh, RF, um, joystick. I mean, it was a lot bigger. You can see how much thicker it was because you had to put batteries. Remember the, the nine volt batteries in there. I always used to take the nine volt batteries and stick it against your tongue, you know, to see if it was, is it good? And then you try to get your little brother and sister to do it and they, ah! and they freak out and it was really funny. And that's how you tortured your uh, siblings back in the days. But um, anyway, uh, I got this one signed by my good friend, Nolan Bushnell, who was Actually, the, you know, the creator, founder of Atari and all that. And uh, so, yeah, this was, this is uh, really cool. Now, um, before I get into the Intellivision stuff, I want to show you this wacky cool thing. This was, uh, this is a Telstar. Now, my very first video game system ever uh, in 1975 was the original Telstar. And this is my machine. This is the very first video game machine. This is the very first time that I ever saw things on a TV screen that I was able to control. Because people back in the day, you got to remember that, you know, this was even before remote controls. You know what the remote control was in the 70s when my dad wanted the channel changed? Me. Hey, Tommy, go and change the channel. Oh, you know, and you change the channel. That's how you did it. Um, so to have technology that you could hook up to the TV and you'd move a dial and see a, a, a paddle move on screen, 
It was like magic. It was really unbelievable. And the Coleco Telstar, 1976, I think I got mine. But this was a different version of the Telstar. Now, the interesting thing about this machine, so you had the Pong, but you also had the gun, right, for shooting games, and you had a steering wheel with a shifter. Now, the amazing thing about this machine is it was designed by Ralph Baer. Now, remember that name. Ralph Baer was the guy who created the home video game system. Back in the late 60s, he created something called the Brown Box. That was his prototype machine that he created the first video game on when he worked for, uh, uh, he started work for Magnavox, and uh, which ended up becoming the first Odyssey machine. Um, but the cool thing about this is, you know, it had, it was cartridge based, but look at these cartridges. They're like silver triangles. They kind of look like little UFOs or something. I just thought this was the coolest thing and they all have like little different games. This one has Naval Battle, Speedball, and Blast Away. And they're all basically Pong and, and Breakout. But, but uh, you know, hey, the names were interesting. Very cool. And, and that's amazing. So yeah, speaking of Odyssey, everyone knows like the Odyssey, the Odyssey 2. But, but were you aware of these? They made a whole bunch of, there's a, this is the Odyssey 100, which is the orange one, but there's a 200, 300, 400, 500. I got them all, all the different colors. Very colorful. A lot of orange consoles back then, which was really, really neat. Now, speaking about Atari, let's move into the Intellivision stuff real quick. So I wanted to show everyone this. I wasn't sure if people knew it. You'll see this is a brand new one, uh, but this is a system that you could plug into your Intellivision and this played all of the Atari games. So a lot of people didn't realize that, but you could play any Atari game that you had, put it in, buy this piece of hardware, put it in, hook it into your Intellivision and every single. So one of the things that Intellivision and Mattel boasted about back in the day was that Intellivision had the biggest video game software library out of any home console to that point because it had because Atari had all of the Atari had all of the you know all of the the most games but then in television kind of one up them by saying oh yeah well we got all your games and all of ours so we win um so that was I thought uh, you guys get a kick out of that uh, some of my other in television stuff uh, one of the other things that in television came out with uh, was called the Aquarius. Uh, didn't do very popular. It was like a home computer system. It had a tape drive. It had a printer, lots of stuff. And they redid a lot of their games. The graphics were a little better. They did Night Stalker and a whole bunch of stuff. This is one of the hardest ones to find, though. This is Burger Time on the Aquarius. And you'll notice it still has, it's still in the shrink wrap, never open. So my shrink wrap stuff, I don't open, but I will open the hardware boxes. In fact, check this out. This is an original six pack of Night Stalker, original in television Night Stalker. You can see the, the little red because Night Stalker came in a red box. But I also know that Night Stalker on our product list was 5305.1. And you'll see right there, 5305.1. So it, it's good to, uh, to, to know, ha have some of this uh, information. This here, and I have opened this as well, this is the Japanese version of the Intellivision. A lot of people didn't realize. I mean, we, there's even a Middle Eastern version. So Intellivision was in the Middle East as well in the 80s. I, I haven't been, I've seen pictures. I haven't been able to find one yet, but hopefully someday. Uh, it's the only one I'm missing in my collection is the Middle Eastern version. Uh, but this is the Japanese version. Uh, pretty rare, and this one was never opened until I did, and you can see the back of the box, and, and even the family uh, picture uh, on, on the front, you know, uh, showed Japanese people, of course, um, which I thought was just very, very cool, and it's in pristine work, uh, uh, pristine stuff. Now, this is one of the holy grails of Intellivision collecting, and this thing's really heavy, but... Whoa, check this out. So this was a very rare thing. 
you'd have to put your Intellivision in here and you could use it as a computer. And I don't know how many of these are in existence. Definitely less than probably 50 to 100, I would imagine. Um, and the reason for that is they, they came out with this, right? And what happened is um, they were, there were uh, compliance issues and, and, also, and they weren't going to, um, they weren't going to support it anymore. So they, they were getting fined every single day that this thing was on the market. So what Mattel decided to do is buy back all of these. They said, look, cause it was ex very expensive at the time. And so they told all the customers, look, we're going to give you your money back. We're sorry. Um, and the only, and then Mattel took them in and destroyed them all. Um, so the ones, the only ones that are out there are the ones that people never gave back. But this one is a very special one because the person who created in television, who did the original hardware of the architecture of the original machine and of this, his name was Dave Chandler, also known as Papa in television. And this was Dave Chandler's uh, original one and I, and I even have the box the box for this as well uh, we got this from his family so this is super super cool super uh, important oh look at this I don't know how this got in here but uh, it's uh, it happens to be a, a red in television I just like the, a red amico just to kind of torture you a little bit um, but now I want to talk about so this here this whoa <laughs> I'm really getting bad at that this is a Super Nintendo development kit right here. And these are all numbered. There's only, uh, there, there, was, there was hundreds of them because they, they did different, um, they did different uh, versions of these. Uh, and, but this was the tower one. This is one of the original early ones is the emulator SE. I've seen these go on eBay for like $20,000. It, it, it's crazy. This was my personal one, though. This is the one that I did Earthworm Jim, Cool Spot, games like that. This is the one uh, that I used. Speaking of development kits, now, this is the original PlayStation. This is the original PlayStation dev kit. And these uh, were given to developers. These are, I don't want to say it's common, because, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty amazing. But, um... But most developers had these. But a lot of people might not know this. The very, very first Sony PlayStation demo disc. Not only did it come with every PlayStation, but when you pre-ordered it at EB Games back in the day or GameStop or whatever, they would give you a promo disc that you could, it was like a CD-ROM that you could play in your computer. I did the music for all those original uh, demo discs. Um, and so the people, and I was one of the first people to ever get a development kit in the United States. And those, I think they were limited to like, I don't know, I want to say, I, I've heard rumors that there was, there's only like 25 to 30 of these in existence. Um, this one, this is like a, it's like a teal greenish blue and this one, you won't see many uh, pictures of. These, yes, but uh, these, no. And you can see the backs are also, you know, very different. So this was an original, original one. Uh, and I was one of the first people in the United States to ever have one because I was working on that, uh, those discs, you know, way before. Check this out. This is for Atari. And I, and I really love this. Um, you know, this was a stunt cycle. And, and, and so, you know, you, you could, I'd love to play our Evil Knievel game on this, right? Um, wouldn't that be something? But, um, you know, these are the types of peripherals that are just so much fun. And people just don't do this kind of stuff anymore. And these are the kind of fun things we want to bring back, right? Imagine having like a Evil Knievel branded, uh, you know, a stunt cycle thing like that or something. Here's a really rare machine. This is very early. Now, this doesn't look like any of the other machines uh, that, that you see because it's so different. It's a CIC, and I, I forget off the top of my head what that stands for. Uh, I'm sure the word computer's in there somewhere. Uh, 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 
complete interactive computer or something. I don't know. But this is actually uh, like a, a Pong type rip, rip off as well. You can see tennis, hockey, squash, and handball. That's, that's the code word for every game is Pong. Um, just set up a little differently. But this is a, a rare machine, a CIC. Those are hard to come by. Did you guys know that, that Hot Wheels did a whole Atari line as well? Look at this, Centipede Cars, Tempest, Pong. Uh, again, things like these I won't open because it's cool to see them on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the cars like that. Oh, this one was fun. I, I brought this down because I thought this would be fun. Again, this is from the 70s, right? And it's a Pong machine. But you'll notice like on how all these machines are really big. Look at this cute little adorable video game system from the 70s. Look at this thing. How cool is this, right? And the, these come off like this and they're little, they're little it, it's almost like a switch. You know, you, 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 you put the controller in two and you get these little, these little tiny, you know, these little tiny um, rectangle things. Um, but I just thought this was the cutest, coolest. It's called a Riva, and uh, and again, you know, all the uh, all the typical games: tennis, hockey, squash. Um, I just I just love this thing, um, and I actually put the, put this one up uh, and, and played it. And you know, you can only play it for so long, but it but it's but it's so much fun uh, to uh, to see these little things. Uh, of course, this is all this is all my one-up modern stuff, my one-up arcade stuff, uh, and, and others as well too. My arcade does this stuff, you know. Mattel Electronics before uh, Mattel did in television, they had their whole electronics division where they did you know the handheld football games, they did baseball, basketball, hockey, they did all the sports. But you know, this is a, a brand new one. But I have my original one uh, upstairs as well. Hey, did you guys know that this existed? This is Oregon Trail. Um, a little, uh, it's, it's a little, and it looks like the old computer and stuff. I love this thing. It's, it came out recently. Oh my God, if you ever have a chance, check out this company. They're really amazing. They create this Tempest machine, but there's like metal in it. Like it's metal and look at the quality of the finish. And, and the spinner and everything on it, really amazing. And they're also the company that does this as well. This is a, a USB, uh, was it five port USB? And it's the old change machine. My, one of my first jobs ever uh, was in an arcade. It was called Just Fun in the Holyoke Mall. And I used to be a change person, you know, wear the, the apron and, and hand out tokens and stuff. But we also had these, so whenever I think of this, and I keep this on my desktop and I use it as a USB, it's cool too even when you turn the light on, the change light goes on like it's uh, just like it when, when it's out of, out of service. It's kind of funny. Um, okay, I want to move to my Nintendo stuff now. All right, I'm sure a lot of you are Nintendo fans out there like I am. So I think you're really going to enjoy some of this stuff. So question for you. What was the very first Nintendo home console. I'll wait. A lot of you are going to say the NES. Uh, some of you might say the Game & Watch. Others might say, well, you know, it was the Famicom. That was what it was called in Japan before it came out, the NES came out here in America. All of those answers would be incorrect. The, 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 the true answer is that Nintendo did what was called, the, it was the worst name ever, the TV Game 6. Dun, da, da, da. The TV Game 6 by Nintendo. Now, you'll see the Nintendo name right down here. 1977, right? So, you know, and again, these are, these are brand new in the box. So I found out that, you know, the, the TV Game 6, you know, now you say, well, he's got two of them. Well, what happened is, look at this, brand new in the box. And, and you can see how it's like, you know, it's like a really nice kind of off-white, uh, like eggshell uh, kind of color. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. And I got that. And then I later found out that they came in different colors, just like in Television Amico. Nintendo knew what was up. And there was an orange one. I'm like, no. And so it took me many years 
but I finally got this one. So this is the orange TV Game 6, Nintendo's very first original home console machine. Now, and then, th then later that became so popular, they did a TV Game 15. Now, one of the things you'll notice, though, about all those machines, it never has the name Nintendo on the actual machine, like in the front or anything like that. Look how cute these are, by the way. Jeez, so fun. Um, they look so great. Um, and so they didn't have Nintendo on there. So I was like, oh, it's a bummer until this model. And this, I absolutely love this one because it has the Nintendo name and it's their logo just the way we know it today, the font and everything. And look at this beautiful orange syndrical with the, the silver on the, uh, on the paddle. So cool. Uh, so this was a one player, you know, kind of Pong machine and, and break, uh, sorry, like breakout and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, it's really, really cool. But this was the first machine that really had the name Nintendo on it. So this is a fun, special one. Now, let's get to the Famicom. Everyone knows the NES, right? So first of all, this is my custom NES uh, that, that I had built uh, and painted. There's a guy on Etsy who does these. I recommend you, ch you checking them out. Look how cool this is. He takes them apart. He pa professionally paints them. I mean, look how beautiful. I mean, if you're gonna have an NES, it's gotta look like this, right? Um, and the controllers and everything, so cool. But as a lot of folks know, uh, the NES in, in, you know, came out in uh, 1985 in the United States, but in 1983, it came out as the Famicom. And this is a Famicom right here. Um, There it is, this is the Famicom. And look at the controllers slide in. They look very much like the NES controllers, except much cooler in my, and they're also rounded. See how the edges are rounded? Remember the NES controller was like square and it hurt? I don't know why they didn't uh, incorporate that rounded design. We have it on Amico now too, right? Um, again, you learn from all these, uh, all these places. Now this here is for the expansion for the disk drive. That's right, look at the beautiful color maroon here. And I was the one who took all of these out of the box. They had never been opened. And uh, so look at this beautiful dark red kind of maroon disk drive for the Famicom. So you kind of stacked it on here like that. That's the whole package right there. Now you're saying, wait a second, there before cartridges, and you can, there's cartridges as well, but when Mario and Zelda and Castlevania and Metroid came out, there were disc versions in 1983? The answer to that is yes. Yes, there was. Look at this, Mario, and, and these have not been opened. I mean, some of these in the shrink wrap, oh, look at that, shrink wraps. Never, this is the original Castlevania on disc, three and a half inch disc. Uh, of course, we got Zelda. This was F1 racing. It's kind of like a, you know, Mario Kart, if you will, but with formula cars with Mario, uh, Zelda, Metroid. We have them all. Um, and did you know you could also do recording on tape as well? And this is it. Look at this. Again, never open. Never open package. This is the original data recorder from Japan for the Famicom. And again, in that beautiful, uh, beautiful red cover. Now, people might have robbed the robots, you know, from the original NES, but do you have the Japanese version because it matches with the maroon and the white? And they did a whole bunch of accessories for this as well, which I have. Um, but really beautiful. I love collecting the stuff from, from Japan. It's really neat. Now, speaking about that in Japan, to end this video, I want to tell you a really interesting story. So in 1983, uh, you know, Nintendo was trying to figure out how they could break into the U.S. market. And ColecoVision had come out in 82 and was picking up a lot of steam. And actually what happened is 
Coleco did a deal with Nintendo to put all of their big games like Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., etc., on Intellivision and Atari. So, if you get a cartridge like this, and again, you'll notice this is in the shrink wrap, never been opened, and this is even more rare because it's the European version. You can see the German writing on it and, and all the different things. Never opened in the shrink wrap. Donkey Kong, so you see the Nintendo logo on here, the Coleco logo, and for the Intellivision on here. Coleco, Intellivision, Atari, Nintendo, they were all one big happy family. So what people don't know is Nintendo and Coleco had a deal where, where Coleco was going to distribute the Famicom in the United States. And the whole de deal went down because the, the industry crashed at the end of 83 in the U.S. going into 84. Nintendo decided to make the bold and smart move to actually put it out themselves. But if not for that crash of 83, we might all know we might never have had a Nintendo NES. It could have been called the Coleco, you know, uh, Coleco Vision 2 or something like that. So anyway, this is a really cool piece of, of history as well. Okay, now I left the very best for last. And remember earlier I was talking about Ralph Baer, the person who created the video game console. Uh, let me show you a little clip of the video that he made in 1968 with the brown box. Yeah, well, here we are, playing ping pong when we ought to be working. Here's our ball, volume back and forth, uh, one feet ball, plus one net, courtesy of a local CATV station. Here's my partner, Bill, and the nine, we're going to play ping pong for you in a minute. But before we do, I'd like to show you the controls that we're using, which are part of the plug-in module, the... Uh, the uh, Ping pong plugin module, gaming plugin module of the all-purpose box we talked about earlier. Pretty cool, right? That's pretty historic stuff. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ralph Bear's one of his original uh, brown boxes. This is this was uh, given to me by Ralph Bear. He was a it was a very dear friend for many many years. In fact, if you watched my PBS special in, back in 2010, uh, I featured Ralph uh, on the show. And yeah, so Ralph made this with his own bare hands. I had him sign it as well, Ralph Bear. Uh, of course, these were never publicly, commercially released. Uh, I hear there's about less than 10 of them in the world. Uh, his son, Mark, has one. There's one in the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, in Washington, D.C. There's one in a museum in his hometown uh, where he was born in Germany. Uh, they have a computer museum there, I think in, around Cologne area. Uh, and there's one in the video game museum in around the Dallas, Texas area, which I highly recommend checking out the video game museum. It's awesome. Um, and there's one in San Francisco as well uh, in the computer museum, or not San Francisco, uh, San Jose in the computer museum there. There's this one, and I know another private collector uh, who has one as well. And that's all that, that I know of. So anyway, so cool, so incredible, Ralph Bear's brown box. So thank you so much for listening to this entire thing, if you made it this far. And uh, don't forget to sign up to the Intellivision Amico mailing list at IntellivisionAmico.com. Please like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for watching. Amico. But I thought this was interesting to, uh, to... <laughs> Look at this great piece of thing. It's very new. Just... Okay, keep it rolling. Take care of my shot. Yeah, I just broke it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that for the bloopers real. <laughs>